Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our listeners from all over the world. My name is Ria Ligari, COP consultant for the UN Women Training Center's Community of Practice. So I'm very lucky to be joined today by uh, Namdi Eseme, who will be speaking to us about female genital mutilation, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and training for gender equality. So this COP interview series is, uh, features a range of interviews with experts on various topics that are related to training for gender equality and building on our series in 2017 and 2018. This edition will run from July through to December 2019. So each interview lasts for half an hour. And uh, please remember that everyone who is listening live has the chance to ask questions uh, using the questions box on uh, the right-hand side of the Glow2 webinar platform. So you can feel free to pose these at any time and I'll either ask them directly to Namde or I'll ask him a little bit later once we've, we've gone through the questions we have prepared for today. So without any further ado, let me introduce today's guest. Namde Aseme is a youth leader, academic, writer, trainer, SRHR advocate, and anti-female genital mutilation campaigner. In addition to serving as a university teaching assistant, he is also the coordinator of the Youth Anti-FGM Network in Nigeria, which is supported by Girl Generation, the Africa-led movement to end FGM across the continent. Namdi is also a senior technical advisor for the Youth Network Against FGM, which is the umbrella body of all youth organizations working to end the practice in Nigeria. He's a member of UNFPA's Youth Participatory Platform in Nigeria, and also a member of the African Youth and Adolescent Network on Population and Health. And previously, he worked as a citizen journalist for the Key Correspondence Network, supported by the International HIV AIDS Alliance. So Namdi, thank you so much for joining us today. I think we might be having a little bit of a technical glitch. But Namdi, can you, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, I can hear you now. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you, Ria, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited to have you with us. And uh, so I thought we'd begin by, of course, like as, I, as I've mentioned, your work is fo focused on ending harmful practices like female genital mutilation and also child marriage. And you really work to improve vulnerable young people's sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I wonder if you could give our listeners to start off some background on these issues in Nigeria and in the other African countries you've worked in and uh, maybe also the underlying causes that sustain these practices. Um, okay, uh, so female genital mutilation, according to the World Health Organization's def definition, refers to all processes involving the partial or total removal of the external female genitalia and the injury to the external female genitalia for uh, non-medical reasons. Oh, I'm sorry about the noise. Um, the practice has been in existence for a very long time. And one of the motivations behind it is um, that um, it is a way of controlling women's sexuality by society. And we understand who the definition of society is in this case, meaning powerful people who seek to control others and believe that they need to dominate um, the other genders, irrespective of what significant negative impact it might have on the psychological, physical, or mental state of um, people who are survivors of the practice. Uh, so female genital mutilation has basically four types. So we have the type one, clitoridectomy, the type two, the type three, which is infibulation, and the type four, which is unclassified. For Nigeria, all of, this, all of these types are practiced, but there are significant um, prevalence of, of this practice in some states. Some states are quite high, like Ebonyi State, which is in the southeastern part of Nigeria. You have Oshun State, which is in the southwestern part of Nigeria. You have Imo State. You have, even in the north, states like Kaduna, states like Kano also practice it, even although there, there is um, little data in most parts of the northern state. But it is quite um, prevalent in the western part of Nigeria and um, down in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Um, it, it's quite interesting to know that uh, female genital mutilation 
for some women is something they have come to accept and in fact reinforce the practice on younger women because um, it is seen as a way of socially conforming to what society expects of you. And again, the older women see it as a way to control or have that power influence over the younger women. As we proceed, I believe I'll be able to explain further on what the processes entails and why we should all come together as one body to try to stop to stop the practice. Very much so. Thank you so much, Ndami. And I wanted to ask also, um, so tying into this, obviously, you know, you're a great expert on, on, on FGM and on sexual and reproductive health, right? So I wonder if you could tell us also a little bit about your personal experience and your professional journey towards becoming an activist. So what first promote, uh, prompted your interest in working on gender equality and reproductive health and specifically on combating female genital mutilation? Well, every, every interesting story has a start, and mine started from a sad personal experience I had. Uh, so my mother, um, who sometimes passed away while growing up, um, had complications, and we went to several hospitals to try to diagnose what the problem was, but because of the poor health system at the time, which, which currently exists anyway, um, she, her, her issue, her health issue could not be diagnosed. However, at the later stage of, of, the, of her life, it was finally diagnosed to be intrauterine bleeding, uncontrolled intrauterine bleeding. And for me, that triggered a personal interest to want to support other women because I felt that at the time, this is something that could have been easily addressed if it was diagnosed on time. So I began to search on the two personal stories to help other women and young girls in my community to see that they do not die unnecessarily or have to fa face unnecessary health complications as a result of lack of information, as a result of poor health systems, or as a result of um, some harmful cultures and practices that they are expected to conform to. And that was how I started a few years back, say seven, eight years ago. I began to speak to young people in my community, went to schools and tried to engage young people on how to improve their sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as give them access to essential reproductive health information. Um, it, it, it went for a while and I eventually got a group of my friends together who we shared the same passion and drive and we set up a network that was focused on addressing harmful cultural practices including female genital mutilation and child marriage. So we started speaking in states where the prevalence was high. We traveled to our your state, we traveled to our Shun, Eboin, Imo. We did a few programs in Lagos and the capital city of Nigeria, Abuja. And our work expanded. Our work expanded as we engage more with communities and survivors of FGM. We got to realize how deeply this, this, this practice is held in the community. And we began to seek the motivations behind the practice and spoke to them. And we realized that for some people, they really do not understand why the practice is being done. For them, it is just a regular thing. It is just the norm. Everyone does it, so I, 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 should be, I should do it if I want to be accepted by society. But when we highlighted the significant negative impact it could have, um, not just short term, but long term, people began to question the motivations. And some people began to speak um, against the practice, which led to a movement of young people in Nigeria that galvanized their strength and voices together to say no to FGM. Um, I have moved from Nigeria and visited other parts of Africa where the practice is currently being, being done. For example, in, in Sierra Leone, which is still part of West Africa, nine out of every 10 women have undergone female genital mutilation. And, and this is from, um, this is evidence in data that has been provided um, by the National Health Commission of Sierra Leone. Uh, the, 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 society, the society in Sierra Leone projects this practice because of the political clout and powerful strength that members of the community have. So it is difficult for people in a country like Sierra Leone or some countries like 
um, South Sudan or Ethiopia to speak against the practice because they would face serious backlash from, from the society. However, as time progresses, we, we got to realize that um, we could actually speak to key influencers and family heads who were seen as leaders and whatever they say, the contributions they make at certain meetings was considered very important. So we use that as an entry point to begin to speak to communities and conduct advocacy, relevant advocacy that are targeted at these people so that we can all work together to see that we end the practice. Um, one, 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 one thing to note about female genital mutilation is that while it is done at infancy, for some communities, it is done all through life. It is done all through life. Even after death, people still feel that for purification of the corpse, I'm sorry, to be, I'm sorry for being too graphic, but for purification of the corpse, they still have to perform female genital mutilation on the corpse. And for us, we, we felt that, okay, a, a, appreciating culture is, is necessary, but what, what are we projecting to the general society about what we do? So we try to bring everyone together and have relevant discussions as to why we should, we should end this practice. And looking at it critically, the practice is reinforced by actually the male, the male dominant um, society. There is what is called the man box where cultures are just reinforced by people so that they can always conform to it. And for our society, which is quite patriarchal in some, in some places, it is a way to see that um, Um, does not have sufficient power sexually to express themselves or to have control over their bodies. However, for the man, no one, no one has um, control over his body because he can do whatever he likes. He can just be himself. And that is one of the angles we are also looking at it from a gender perspective and reviewing every process using a gender lens. That's an excellent. I'm I'm bowled over by how um, inspiring and how uh, far-reaching your work has been. And I wonder, like we you've spoken a little bit about you know the advocacy work and how going into communities, especially and getting and we're looking for these entry points, especially looking for the gatekeepers, let's say, of you know powerful traditional practices. How that helps. But I wonder, since you're doing this work, and this can be very sensitive, I suppose, in in, in many communities, especially. And I wonder what kind of resistances you've experienced as a trainer, either you know at the community level or individual level or maybe organizational level as well, when you approach and navigate. You issues how do you how do you address the resistances that you've experienced well um thank you for that very valid question approaching the issue of female genital mutilation um involves a very careful um method you have to first identify people who who you create as allies and who would support you in your work. And it could be quite difficult. Even, even in enlightened societies, you're always going to face resistances. Uh, from a group of people, because they feel that um, you're coming to speak against the practices of threat to what they have believed or through their life or the power they hold on to. So they would try to set up these resistances, but, but, doing proper um, values clarification of the issue and engaging them in dialogues, giving them the opportunity to speak, giving them the opportunity to express themselves and working together to see that we all come to a, um, a level ground where everyone's opinion is valued, where everyone is seen to be relevant and where we can all brainstorm on the real issues looking at the bigger picture. So that is how um, I have tried to go about it. And I believe that there are other innovative strategies or approaches to use, which we keep learning by the day. But a significant way, again, to go about it is to in, engage young people, because young people are the most affected. Young people are the ones who grow up to become fathers, who grow up to become leaders, who grow up to become mothers. So when we look at an intergenerational approach that doesn't just focus on the 
the older members of society, but also focuses on young people, then we can have intergenerational dialogues so that the young people can express themselves about how they are being affected by the practice, while the older generation come up with their ideas, which, which are quite beneficial as well, but both parties, as well as the women groups, as well as the, as the youth group, educational institutions, religious organizations and leaders, in, even political leaders, all come together, have this dialogue on social change transformation and social change communications and every process that would lead to significant deviation from the norm, which is quite harmful to our society, then we can all be, be, be one and, and work together towards it. It involves a lot of approaches, I would say. I would agree. And I, and I think, well, well, let's talk about one of the approaches then, for example, what, what do you think training adds to this? Because as you say, you know, to get people together and to get people brainstorming and, and in, engaged in a dialogue, do you think training is a particularly effective method to bring that about? I, I, I totally agree. Training is quite effective. Training is quite effective. But one has to be careful about the kind of training being conducted. For one reason, the resistance that most people face is because they always project themselves as the all-knowing person, especially those who conduct training. So when you go into a community that is, it is your first time, you do not understand the culture or particular differences in, in, in that particular, in that setting, you don't just come as a facilitator who, who knows everything because you would be seen as someone coming to project the Western knowledge that is, um, that is against the culture. So the, the training would take more uh, um, the form of dialogue where people are, are gathered together and everyone gets to contribute to the session. It, um, before now, before now, the training that we've always experienced is having this one facilitator come in and for the next four or five hours or a couple of days, this one facilitator is telling the community members what to do condemning the culture and make and painting a picture of um, cultures being barbaric, cultures being archaic, culture being old and should be thrown away. So but a better approach to that would, would be a training session that is designed in terms of dialogue, which is what, um, what was done at the, which is what some organizations do, like the UN Women um, during the gender training program at the KIT Rio Tropical Institute in the Netherlands, as, as well as others. That was quite an innovative approach being used um, to gather a group of facilitators and improve their knowledge on training skills, improve their knowledge on facilitation skills, and improve their knowledge on critically listening to participants so that they can get information that is important and use that to build on the training process. That's excellent. I agree. That ties in very nicely with, with the next question I had, because, I, yes, I wanted to say that you've participated in, in the professional development of gender trainers program, as you said, by the, the UN Women Training Center and uh, the Rural Tropical Institute of, of the Netherlands. And, and I wonder, we, we could discuss maybe a bit more about your experience, like what kind of value has it had and what did, what did you learn most maybe from the experience and what value has this had in your training? And also, I mean, I suppose you already spoke a little bit about the fact that, you know, you need to get facilitators together and like in order to, you know, disseminate this dialogue. But I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about that well that, that was an interesting experience for me and have been quite significant in my on my career path in fact i feel i felt that the, the training by the u.n women training center at kit in the netherlands was apt it was quite necessary at that point in my career because the training gathered the training gathered all of these facilitators from across the world with diverse experiences, with, with, with differences in years of experience together for everyone to contribute. So you had very young facilitators and you had quite experienced facilitators all coming to share knowledge in an environment that was welcoming, in an environment that was conducive and an environment that was not judgmental. It was a typical representation of what we experience out there in the field. So you have leaders, you have the young, you have middle class, middle aged people all gathered in the room. It can be quite difficult for some facilitators to engage in such a setting. But the experience by the UN Women Training Center taught me that you can actually use um, very 
um, subversive power. You can use subversive power in trying to explain your point. You can also look at the intersectionalities of gender when speaking about issues that are quite um, significant or issues that touch deeply about certain people's feelings. So you can use different approaches to this. And for me, it, it really helped me, it really helped me that I was able to understand how some of the world's renowned um, facilitators and activists in this, in this particular area were able to do their work and how I can use their approaches to define my work and improve on, on what I do. And one other thing I would say is that the collaboration experience during the training by UN Women has been really helpful because after the during and after the program, participants have kept along together. There have been communications, partnerships have been established, and we have been trying to work together to see how we can use our experience in a different setting to, to replicate the best practice in in our own setting. The idea, however, is, is, is not just to replicate, but the idea is to improve is to improve on what we do. Uh, yes, and I would, I would say, I would encourage every facilitator um, who is out there doing amazing stuff on, on sexual and reproductive health and rights, on education, on agriculture, to actually be part of that program because it's a, it's a massive learning experience. I tell you, if I had the opportunity, I'd, I'd want to be trained again by the UN Women Training Center on that particular professional development training program. Actually, I'm considering that for next year's cohort. That's, that's wonderful. It's a very positive thing. I'm really glad. And I, I really like what you said, especially about the collaboration and the fact that, you know, there's this network now and you've kept in touch and, you know, that, that really enriches, I think, the training that, that we're able to deliver. And I wonder if, if you could also mention maybe, because obviously, as you said, you've, you've delivered trainings and you've done advocacy in, in many different parts of Nigeria. And Nigeria is a very diverse country. And obviously, Africa as a whole is very diverse. And now, you, for example, today you're in Sierra Leone. So how do you, as, as you mentioned before about, you know, we need to be uh, sensitive to the culture and the context and to understand it and to really give people, you know, an opportunity to express themselves in training. So so what kind of research maybe or what kind of background do you do you try to go into in order to really understand the specificities of the cultures that you're you're engaging with well you 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 try to what one thing i have tried to do because working in nigeria working in syria Leone, in ghana and kenya they, they all have this different cultures and, and at first you could experience a culture shock which could um, deeply affect your work but but i would say first listen that's that the the, the first approach listen which is something we learned at the at the training by the un women training center at kit that you first listen you first create an environment for people to familiarize themselves and get to feel quite comfortable and that the setting should be non-judgmental in any way. When people get to vehemently or strongly defend their point, it, it is good for, for such conversations to keep going because it keeps the whole, um, it keeps the whole environment, it makes the whole environment feel safe for everyone. So that, that is the research, that's the method I, I use most of the time. I let people express themselves and you do not make people feel that you know everything because you, you really do not know everything. Um, I would refer back to my experience at uh, the um, UN Women Training Center at KIT. Um, when most of us came, we had a, a we almost all of us had a binary definition of gender, despite working in the area of gender, in the field of gender for quite a number of years. But somehow, because we have internalized that binary definition of gender, every time we, we spoke or tried to define something, which is also reflected in our facilitation sessions, every time we try to reflect um, a particular idea in our heads, we have a binary definition of gender. We do not consider the intersectionalities of gender. We do not consider education, class, geographical location, um, social inclination, sexual orientation, and all of that. So it, it, it's, 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 it is advisable to be quite um, careful and to engage every, every approach that you feel and have been proven to be wise, to be safe, and to be accommodating. That's very positive. I think that's a very 
good way. It also it touches, I guess, on on the idea, this idea of reflexivity about you know as as facilitators and as trainers, really looking at our own presumptions when we come into a training or when we just start doing work. This idea of yes, a, a really ingrained um, conception about what the gender binary is, as opposed to looking at you know gender is more of a spectrum and looking at intersectional issues, as you as you mentioned. And I think this touches on very nicely on on uh, a question that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, you know, when you when you go into trainings, when in your experience, um, can you tell us maybe a, a story or a, a, any incident that you you've had where you've experienced or you've witnessed change, either in the participants or in yourself through a training, you know, either program or a session or, or anything like that? Oh, exactly. I I have one particular one which I like sharing all the time, and this is with a health worker. So there, there, I was in a training somewhere in Delta State, which is again in the southeastern part of Nigeria. And we had this training for nurses because we were trying to point out how medicalization of female genital mutilation is actually um, reinforcing the practice. So uh, this, this um, nurse had an 18-year-old son who... She feels um, is safe and knew nothing about sex and hasn't um, become quite active in that particular area. And our facilitation for that day was on value clarif values clarification and attitudinal transformation. So we wanted to get people to clarify their values and begin their, to change their attitudes towards certain topics. We know that female genital mutilation and anything related to sexual and reproductive health, especially for young people, is a taboo subject, more so if it is coming from the parent to the, to the child or from an older person to a younger person. So during our discussions, I had asked the question that how many of us can engage our children, our sons and our daughters on sex? And everyone was feeling shy, everyone felt shy. And I asked how many of us know, already knows that our sons and our daughters are having sex? And hands began to come up. So there, there, there is always that denial. <laughs> there is always that denial that um, this thing is happening, but but I just want to believe that it is not happening. Uh, but at the at the end of the of the training, there was this complete change by participants and that particular nurse. She said that she she admits that her son. Has, be, has started having sex because she goes she goes through his phones his phone chat she notices the kind of friends he keeps but she has just been afraid of speaking um, about sex to her son which is the, the a similar thing that people who um, survivors of FGM or families who were forced into um, um, practicing um, FGM face that you want to speak against it, but you begin to consider the, the backlash that you will face. You might be ostracized from the community if you, if you get to speak about it. Uh, but she decided to change and said from that very day, she would um, engage her son as a friend and engage her son at his own level so that they can both discuss these issues and he can be informed about using protection, about, about uh, the dangers of unprotected sex and how to take care of himself. And that she would like him to, in, for him to introduce his girlfriend or who his partner, whoever he was seeing at the time, to her so that they can all know themselves and everything moves smoothly. So for me, that is, that is a very clear example. And I really felt proud of myself that at the end of that um, session, at least one person was confident on changing and moving forward using a better approach. That's wonderful. That's something to be very, very proud about. And I think all your work sounds so inspiring and so important. And you should definitely be proud of, of doing all of it. And uh, I wonder if you have any just maybe parting words and just advice for either facilitators coming into this or maybe youth activists. As you said, you know, youth is so important, especially around the, the most affected and the most um, maybe also like one of the, the best place to, to evoke change and to, and to, you know, sort of positively uh, engage in dialogues. So I wonder if you have any parting words for, for either facilitators or activists. Yes, um, I will start from the last statement. One of the best places to ev evoke change is within yourself. First, you must accept that you can change. Uh, it is a mistake that most of the facilitators do that they do not see this 
um, attitude ingrained in themselves, they always see the challenge in the other person. We first need to look us at ourselves because we come from some practicing communities. We come from communities where it is a norm to practice uh, some harmful um, norms. So we need to change ourselves first and keep an open mind to new knowledge before we can change others. And for young people, I want to say that the time is now and the, the changes in your hands. We are change agents and we can speak for issues that concern us. We can begin to be assertive about our bodies. We can begin to take control of what happens to us. And culture is not static. It is fluid because it has been practiced in the last 500 years doesn't mean it should continue if it is harmful. We know of cultures that has changed over time and that's the beautiful thing about culture. We can improve on cultures to make it better. We can build on the positives and cut out the negatives so that we create a society where everyone is safe, where there is gender equality, where there is equity, and where there is total respect for life and health. Um, for other facilitators out there, I would also say that let's keep learning, let's keep collaborating, and let's keep supporting one another in, in this particular movement, that there, there are links as to everything we do. If you work on agriculture, it can actually be linked to female genital mutilation because women have been shown, research that women are the ones who work more on the farm and who do the burden of the work while the men are seen as um, the, the bigger farmers, the, the, the ones who have to make all the money. And that power difference, that, that power control is also reflected in how women try to subject themselves to female genital mutilation because they want to be seen as good women for the men. They want to be seen as people who, they want to be seen as conforming to what society expects of them so that they can be married so that it can be seen as decent, so that it can be seen as responsible. And all of that, I would say, is something that facilitators need to take into consideration, that during your sessions, during your training or engagement with communities, try and create a link. Perhaps your, your establishment of these links with other areas of society would address someone's burning question even before the person has or will clear a particular resistance before it comes up. That's wonderful. That's a very strong message, I think, to end on. And I'm very sorry that we're coming to the end of the, of the interview, but I want to thank you so much, Namdi, for joining us. It was really inspiring and really enlightening and such a pleasure to, to speak to you today. Oh, my, my, my pleasure. I, I, I feel really humbled to be here and thank you for the amazing work you are doing. Thank you. Very, thank you. And uh, I'm very happy to, to, to mention that well, every, everyone who's not listening to this live, we have a couple of speakers uh, or a couple of uh, listeners with us right now. Um, we don't seem to have, well, we have one question actually from Ethel, who says, um, I think the problem with us is the lack of political will to bring stringent laws around inhumane acts such as these. Um, she says that she doesn't think it's, it's uh, necessarily a cultural issue, but maybe also an issue of of political will, and you mentioned a little bit when when we were speaking, like um, it also you know about the gatekeepers and about the the decision makers and everything. So I wonder how how do you think that 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 it's a problem of laws, or do you think it's it's maybe a problem partly of implementation, but also of of you know of community level norms and just you know like being very embedded. Well, I I, I think it is um, a challenge of attitude. We have laws, in fact, beautifully written laws on paper that goes into the shelves and remain there. They're meant for the shelves. Um, some states have domesticated um, violence against persons prohibitions. Uh, some states have come up with creative laws that um, if you look at it on paper, it, it, it is going to completely end the practice. But the thing is our attitudes, our attitudes to it and the attitude to it is not just about the political leaders because these political leaders are all also influenced by pressure from their communities they represent communities who they uh how do, who they are subjective to like when when they're coming out for their campaigns they have to consult a few people in the community and these people are the custodians of the same culture that reinforce 
that reinforce those practices. So they have to obey. I'll give you a clear example. In Sierra Leone, for example, there is the Bondo Society, which wields so much political power. And the Bondo Society is the society that practices or, or, or puts girls through female genital mutilation. So it is quite difficult for even political leaders to speak against the Bondo Society. That means they won't be able to go back home. They, their children will be ostracized from the community and they cannot represent the people who they're directly fighting against. So I believe it is a change within ourselves and our attitudes or approach towards it. Uh, one, one mistake that we all make is, is by condemning our cultures. We understand that it is quite harmful, but most people do not see it as harmful. In fact, they see it as, as the, the best way to live their life. So what we do is share more knowledge, share more knowledge, encourage more people to engage in the conversation and always present ourselves as allies, as coming to create partnerships. Uh, and that way there would be safety and there will be the willingness to listen. And from the willingness to listen, we can all have this reasonable conversation that can lead to change. It might not happen immediately. It might take a couple of years. It might take a couple of months or it might happen instantly, but it is a gradual process, which we must be appreciative of. I would agree. And I think this message of, of sharing and of dialogue and of really looking at ourselves and, you know, individual level change, individual level attitudinal change, and uh, then, you know, coming out to the wider community is a very powerful message. And uh, yeah, so once again, thank you so much, Sandy. I'm afraid we're out of time, but this interview is going to be posted on the UN Women Training Center's YouTube channel. So um, I'd encourage everyone who listens to it to also share it with their networks and share it as far and wide as possible, because I think everyone has a lot to learn from your really important, wonderful work. So thank you so much, Sandy, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you to everyone who listened. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.